and hello there and a very, very warm welcome to Frontiers of Innovation. This is a virtual live initiative brought to you by Canon and we're absolutely delighted that you're here and that you've joined us on this platform from all around the region, indeed from all around the world I'm beginning to see. So it's really, really exciting. But then again, we have a great program in place for you. I'm Etna Trainer, your moderator for this program. Now, uh, you will know that March is around the world in many countries, not all yet, Women's History Month. And many countries celebrating all the great work that women have done. And earlier in March, we had Women's International Day. You know, so today we are focusing now on empowering women in the creative industry. So in this webinar brought to you by Canon. Now, of course, we want you, our dear audience, to be involved. We have three great speakers, and we'd love you to ask some questions throughout the session, and I'll make sure that we can do our best to engage with our panelists and to make sure we engage with you, our dear audience. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion. So let's now meet our uh, great panel lineup. And we have the founder of Niche Arabia and the author of the first ever Saudi street style book, Under the Abaya. So Mariam Mosali joins us. Um, I'm just going to give her a quick wave there and we'll come and we'll talk to them all in you know, great detail in a moment. We also have an investigative photographer and storyteller, Tasneem Al Sultan, who's also with us. And we have the founder of Art Trove, and that is Aya Toucan. So here's our great panelists, and um, I just couldn't be happier to have everybody in place, an inspiring group of women without a doubt. Mariam, let me start with you. And you really built up over the past 10 years a tremendous successful brand, um, again, based you know, primarily on your passion, on your conviction that you know, it is about Saudis telling their own story, because if not, somebody else will be telling it. And I think that's what's been happening for several years. How important is this to you? Well, I mean, I think it's super important. I think, you know, as women, we want our stories to be told and who better than ourselves to tell it. Um, you know, I think, you know, throughout the years when I first started in 2007 in media, I found it really interesting that even as Saudis, we were still copy pasting our stories from The Wire. It wasn't even authored by us. I mean, that's changed dramatically now over the years. And I think you're seeing this dialogue happening. I mean, if women want, you know, a seat at the table, we need to be able to, to have a voice. And I think, you know, having these different outlets whether it's in media or in the private sector through books, this is crucial. So for me, that's always been kind of the, the main thing throughout, I think, my you know 15-year career. I like that, yes. It's, it, it is about having that seat at the table and it's about making sure that we use it as well. So it's, and we're going to hear a lot more. I know we're beginning to hear a lot more from Saudi women, which is just wonderful. And I think the world just embraces it so much. Uh, Tasneem, you're the first Arab woman photographer for National Geographic. Um, you're recognized internationally. You're the first Arab female to be a Canon ambassador. Uh, you, you have so much, your accolades from around the world. But how did you make that shift from one studying social and gender issues, social linguistics, teaching English, and shifting over to photography? And then it was wedding photography, but with a twist. So tell us a little bit about this, because I think it's a fascinating story. Um, thank you for asking and, and for sharing that. I... I think I, I I was born in the U.S. and I grew up uh, between U.S. and U.K. and I would only visit Saudi on you know summer vacations. So I always felt like a, a bit of an outsider. But at the same time, I wasn't really an insider to the Western Hemisphere because I'm still the Arab you know Saudi kid. So I tried to always navigate between the two. And I realized, especially studying um, an avid reader at a young age, but studying English literature specifically, that there are so much commonalities between cultures and, and human um, attributes that we just don't know enough about. So whether I come to visit Saudi or I'm traveling the Arab um, world, there's so many things that we have been usually stereotyped as either villains or victims. And I think there's so much more of the spectrum that is very far from that. Um, empowering stories, especially about women, like Mariam said, we've usually had a lot of kind of outsiders, parachute photographers or journalists come and tell our narrative. And in the last few years, you've seen a huge transition that we've started to kind of shift. And the gatekeepers also have started kind of realizing that it's time to give way for the local um, storytellers. It is. I think there's tremendous initiatives coming out of the region. And I, uh, you know, you spent time working with NGOs and now you found a very successful social enterprise, really. And one with, again, with the, with the twist, so to speak, really fusing, fuse, fusing artesian-made products and then contemporary handicraft home decor. 
uh, you know, how did you know such a concept would actually work and build a livelihood for, for you and indeed for many deserving women who you brought into this organization? Yes, that's a good question, actually. Thank you, Ethna. Um, it was a journey of exploration for me. I, did, I had no idea. I was very into that world of artisan and that world of culture and what culture brings to people. I wanted to delve both the world of creativity, culture, and, and the artisan community together. So I found this to be my gateway to start exploring with artisans and volunteering with NGOs and getting involved with them. And I found that Jordan is so rich in heritage, so rich in culture, and we do have the resources. We have very like natural resources that people don't really know about. So I started my journey with working and collaborating with NGOs. So we started uh, working on natural and basketry making and explored the world of natural dyes and embroidery and how we can incorporate all of this into one and bring it to the modern age and the, the modern consumers basically. Um, we did, we did delve into embroidery and um, basically after having volunteered with NGOs, I found out that there are women, independent women in their homes that are work, that want to work and that are seeking jobs, but could not access these kind of markets. So I started collaborating with artisan women living in their homes, basically independent women. And we started creating pieces to bring them closer to the market for women and the modern age consumer to, to appreciate them. And I've, I've seen that people would appreciate the stories, the, the, the concept of being artisan, made, being artisan made, but bringing it to a world of modernism, a world where like everything is very fast paced, but this one's made like, this one's what these were made handmade and they had their stories basically, and they have their cultural assets basically. Really, and I love that so much too, because it is one thing that's coming through all of you is that it is, it's about storytelling in one way or another. And I think a very, very rich heritage there that you're all bringing to life. Now, Miriam, you had a background in newspapers and feature journalism too, and it's a career that many people would aspire to. And we're probably seeing more careers like this, you know, among Saudi women. Um, but talk to me about how you branched out on your own. Why did you make that decision while you were doing one career and you thought there's so much more to this? Well, funny enough, I actually, when I resigned from the newspaper, I was working for the leading English newspaper in the region. I didn't tell my family about it. And it was like a few weeks into it where my dad was like, why are you always home? And I was like, surprise. And I was like, I need you to go register my company. Um, I knew that it was, you know, taking this jump that, you know, maybe a lot of people might not think was the smart move, but I know I needed to be first in the market. And what I essentially started with Niche Arabia was a communications consulting firm that worked with international brands on how to communicate to the local consumer. So it's her 360 needs, whether it was beauty, fashion, um, you know, entertainment, it didn't matter. But I, I knew that, you know, as Saudis, we are, you know, one of the top consumers when it comes to let's say luxury items or art and these and these and these sectors. And and yet we're kind of lumped together as as a generic like, oh, Middle Eastern woman. And I wanted to have that attention. And I wanted to have that curation. And so you know, 10 years ago, I, I started Niche and, you know, alhamdulillah, it's, you know, it's grown and it's expanded. We have teams in Jeddah, Riyadh, Khobar. Um, we work with young Saudis as well and try to, you know, um, encourage them to assert themselves and to also know, you know, their value. Because I think, you know, one of the things that I'm trying to fight now, you, know, you just said it, we have a lot of initiatives coming in, but we don't want token gestures. We want to make sure that these are investments. It's not just a, oh, you know, I want to tap into the Saudi market because I see that they have good spending power, but to actually relate to these women and to curate, for, you know, their a selection for them. And so I think, you know, for, for me, Niche, that was kind of the initiative was to push that and say, hey, you know, we're here to stay and we want to make sure that things are catered towards us. Yes, indeed. And, and I think that the world's going to hear a lot more from a lot more uh, Saudi women in the years to come. Oh. It is it's very exciting. And I think having had the privilege to go visit, it's, um, you know, there's some tremendous talent there, some tremendous creativity and, um, and some great friends of mine there too. So I have to spend more time in Saudi and now I have a few new friends. So I'm going to have to go visit you guys as well. Um, talk to me, Tasneem, in terms of, you know, your, you know, your passion and your profession is very much one at this point, I mean, you know, being a storyteller, engaging, you know, uniting, inspiring, but a big focus too on, on women 
why particularly this? I mean, was it just what was, you know, easier for you at the time? Or, you know, there was also something else, I think, close to your heart that you, you told these stories and continue to. <laughs> You've expanded that um, narrative so much. Yeah, so I, you know, I thought that a good idea when I moved back to Saudi at the age of 15, 16 was to get married. Um, you know, to, I thought that was the best thing. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Long story short. Yeah. Um, hang on. Long story short, I am, um, I'm a mother of two teenage daughters and I am very much now a very independent woman. I, at the time, struggled to gain divorce because of the constraints from society itself. Sometimes, you know, I think especially for Saudi women up until recently, there were a lot of things that were constraints and obstacles by society. Um, divorce is a taboo. And um, I, Am I back? Sorry, I think I'm getting a call. So anyway, um, I felt that I wanted to pursue my master's. I studied uh, social anthropology and, and social linguistics. And photography was always a hobby. Like many of them also, my parents were are both professors and they weren't much, you know, supportive of the arts realm because it's not frowned upon, but it's just something that will not, as my dad always says, um, my akil aish, like it, w- it won't be something to feed you long term. So this was over 10 years ago. I quit my lecturing job at university and started photographing weddings. I suppose that for me, it was more of an escape of my own unhappy marriage to photograph other people's happily ever after. And soon after I started photographing, after five years, I thought I should actually start a journey in photographing everyone, the spectrum of love, marriage, divorce, loss. And I think those are very universal themes that all women across the world and even men go through. But specifically to Saudi women, I think it's not just because I'm a Saudi, but of all the women that I photographed, and I photographed in over 21 different countries, stories that have been published, you know, like you said, in in very big publications, but I very much admire and I'm constantly inspired by the Saudi women because of the obstacles that they have faced from their own, from their own society, from their own families. And they've always just amazed me by how, you know, we couldn't drive, but yet there were women that were lawyers, that were doctors, that were professors. So nothing could stop them from doing what they really wanted to do. Yes. And I think this is, you know, it's a theme. I'm not, I'm not excusing, you know, your parents or anybody else, but, you know, the fact that they would say to you, you know, why would you do something like that? It's not going to feed you. I, I think that's a theme of worried parents around the world. And, you know, when it comes to creativity, there's a lot of people who think it's not going to be something whereby it can be an industry. And um, Aya, even for, you know, what you're doing and looking probably at the work that the ladies were doing, I think we have to, you know, look back and think for them, this was probably a hobby. This was probably, yes, part of their tradition. But the fact that you've turned this round, you know, into a social enterprise, into a business, you know, they must be finding this incredibly rewarding and liberating. And I'm sure, you know, a lot of other people are looking at this and thinking, you know, they have to stand back and just, uh, you know, congratulate you two on a job well done. And it is the old, you're on mute. I, I never thought I'd have to say it again. There we go. <laughs> yeah, it was it was actually a journey. It was for me, it was an unknown world that I'm delving into and like a very untapped society and untapped culture kind of. So I had to do my research first. I had to like look into case studies, look into the internet and really like delve into it more. I couldn't find the kind of information I wanted. And even like I wanted to go do a course, a program, and there wasn't this kind of course that offered creativity in this kind of area. Like I did see a lot of um, women, like NGOs offering uh, jobs for women to empower them and all of that, but it wasn't really in like a creative kind of set of mind. So I wanted to really like delve into creativity, but also um, harness innovation and keep it, keep it rela- relatable to us, you know? So, and also I really felt that women from that kind of um, community and culture, they came from a place where they 
they kind of felt like they have to do the work because they have to sustain themselves and that's it. It's like a quick fix. But no, it, it needs to be sustainable. It needs to be a long-term thing. It needs to be that they need to access financial freedom and financial independence. It's not just financial support for now and that's it. No, it's a long-term thing that we where we can delve into different creative aspects, bring in different creative techniques and different design mediums, different materials, different cultures, so it's all about that. It's all about the fusion of bringing everything together and turning it into a sustainable and actual business and keep it going. You know, it's not just like we're looking into embroidery and that's it. We're looking into it being uh, uh, like an artisanal project and that's it. No, we're looking into more materials and incorporating their work into these materials. It's, it's I that. Talk more, yes, I mean, it's just you, some of the work is just, it's stunning. And it's worth having a look at Art Trove on social mm -hmm. media. There's some beautiful, beautiful work. It's a, it's, it's a showcase of your work. And in fact, looking at all your social media outlets is a showcase of all of your work. Um, Marion, if I can come back to you and just maybe continue this theme, as you were saying, you know, you were quietly doing your work and even, you know, <laughs> you know it, it, it was all happening because it wasn't, maybe acceptable at the time, but talk to me about the changes in Saudi uh, culture, the changes in focus. When we look at educational establishments, and I see even plans for new cities that have been put in place, and lots of them with a, a cultural zone and lots of new focus, you know, in terms of education. I had, uh, you know, the delight with, to work with the MISC Foundation not too long ago on a project. And again, the focus, looking at culture and really making sure that, you know, young Saudis, can become artists, they can become DJs, they can become designers. There's a whole new catalog of um, professions that probably weren't top of the agenda a while back. How will this change? And of course, you're doing your bit to empower the youth as well. Talk to me a little bit about that. So, I mean, I think one of the things I always like to state is that, you know, I don't think that Vision 2030 was announced and all of a sudden, boom, we all got up and did stuff. You know, women have for a long time, or, and even the youth have been very active in Saudi. I think what's, re what's really changed is the fact that it's no longer taboo to showcase it. It's no longer taboo to own it. Like for the first time we are opening our doors from the private world to show the public. But these things, we were active, you know, it's it's kind of like my book Under the Abai, it's like underneath is this woman that has always been active. It's not just, um, you know, all of a sudden the past few years we're doing it. I mean, it definitely there have been government initiatives now that support us and that are pushing us to go into the limelight. And I, and I love that. And I think, you know, what's interesting about Saudi um, you know, very unique to it is that we're seeing this change coming from the top um, up, you know, and then, I mean, from the top down. So what we're seeing is that you're seeing Princess Rima bin Benzer speaking at Davos, you're seeing Jahara bin Talal speaking at, you know, Agfan, you're seeing these big names out there showing their face, showing their names. It's no longer Om Saud or, you know, in relation to a man, you know, you have your identity. And I think that's what's super exciting for the first time that's changed and really happening. And then to go back into this, you know, idea of what's happening with the government, you know, like you said, MISC and these initiatives. I think, again, Saudi is very cautious about us, um, you know, opening up our doors so fast that we want to make sure that we retain our culture because our society is very much embedded in our tradition. And I don't think being modern and being traditional are mutually exclusive. You can be both. And I think Saudi is in the prime place to show that to the rest of the world. I mean, places like Istanbul, for example, have a really cool balance, I think, of both. Um, and I think, you know, Saudi is one of those places as well. Um, and I, Again, when it comes to these initiatives, I, I think it's really just about being these platforms in order for people to show what we've already been doing. Now, Tasneem, you know, you've traveled, uh, you know, around KS and you've talked to so many women and you've got great stories. You know, do you think, too, there's so many of these stories that have been, they've almost been private stories and they deserve to be shared. And people are genuinely interested in these stories. It's not just a you know, voyeurism, it's not just a curiosity, they're actually, um, and yes, perhaps sometimes it, it is a bit of a surprise to people, but um, it's, it's a lovely surprise. But again, it's about telling a real story about real people and the struggles and the joys of their life. Yeah, I think a lot of um, the struggles are, like I said, very universal, you know, um, falling in love, getting divorced, being a widow, um, raising a family of one, two, sometimes 10 children. And I think those, those stories that are very much important to share because it does bring us closer. It does make us more united and it does make the strange more approachable. Um, and I think that's what we were lacking in the past. We were always seeing um, any society that's very distant from ours as 
scary and intimidating. And once you fear, then you'll never, you'll alienate them. And, and that's really what's the issue that we've been having in the past. And um, fortunately for photography and for digital media and social media, we're, we are very lucky that it has brought us much, much closer, especially now during the time of COVID. We are forced to sit in front of our screens and see through every platform stories that are very much close to our hearts. Um, the stories that I photographed in Saudi, I've been to nearly now all the regions of my own country, which was something that I didn't really have a lot of, I didn't dedicate all my time to. I dedicate most of my time to larger cities because people I know and I trust. And one of the most wonderful things that I've I've started learning about Saudi society is that people just want their stories to be told. They want to be, you know, they're so friendly and they're so approachable. And I'm, I'm super happy. I'm literally right now in Jazan, like in the middle of the mountains, an open space. And I've just been helped by every random person on the streets, asking them for directions, asking them for stories. You know, people have opened up their doors. And I think as a woman, I have much more intimate access than any man has in the world, whether Saudi or not, because I have access to photograph and document the lives of women, whether they're covered or not. And they will open up because I'm similar to them. I have similar stories to them. I'm, you know, I'm, uh, they, they see themselves, we see ourselves in each other and that, you know, I, I love my male um, <laughs> brothers, but in the end, it's just very different. I have much more wider access, I guess, than um, a man has. Actually, stay with that for a moment, because I'm just thinking about this. I can just imagine, of course, you know, um, in the past and probably even at the moment, you know, um, male photographers are not necessarily going to get that access, whereby you have the option to talk to, to families, you know, with male and female, and probably some men will do interviews with you as well. Um, the brothers, the cousins, the fathers, the grandfathers, everybody in place. But you you have more access probably to a family than perhaps, you know, your male competitors might have to, to ladies. So, uh, and that's, that, that's encouraging. That's good. Yeah. And so in 2015, I photographed the first woman playing in a basketball and walking in the stadium. The first time Saudi women were in a stadium watching football. Um, the first, like every time there was a first, I got to be there as a woman and I get to photograph all these women. And I photographed over 200 weddings in Saudi alone, other than the other countries. And like I said before, a man can't photograph any like a group of four women if they're not comfortable. So yeah, I, I do have to, you know, always cheer other women and say we have much more access than they'll ever have. Um, now, Aya, talk to me about, you know, what happened in the last year or two, you know, when you look at the work you're doing and you're dealing with, you know, a lot of women who love their traditional handicrafts. And I bet they were very excited with the fact that you could turn these around and, you know, sell them and make money and make this a viable business. But uh, things changed a little bit during the last year. How did you make sure that you kept, you know, sustainability in your business and how did you manage to pivot? Okay, so for starters, the the kind of designs I was exposing the artisans to were very contemporary, very colorful. And I was a bit skeptical at the beginning because they were not aligned with their traditions, kind of, you know. So they were kind of the designs that would inspire me if I see something in my travels, nature. It was very, it was a mix of a lot of a lot of of my inspiration so it was for me it was a test at the beginning and I saw how like happy they were how much like these colors brought them happiness and everything and so like of course at the the, the past year we with the artisan work we we couldn't have access to to their workshops to um to their communities basically because of the rise of COVID in Jordan. So what we did is we took all of the, the designs they've made in the past year or two and turned their designs into an illustration. And we called this the art robe illustration. And we used it um, on different materials. We started with plexiglass and started and diversified our product range basically. Uh, we started with trays, boxes, and we diversified to um, uh, to board games just recently, like a month and a half ago. And that's the Netflix, the Netflix effect, I guess. It's thanks to the Queen's Gambit. Basically what we did, we used that illustration and we took all the elements in the illustration. We started exploring with it and um, just placed all the elements in the illustration in our board games. So, yeah. 
And and they're, they're so lovely. The chess game, you know, the dominoes, all of that. They really, particularly some of the chess games, they look so beautiful. So well done. Keep up that great work because I think you're definitely going to be on to a winner there. It's 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 really, really lovely work. Uh, Mary, I you had to um, diversify to like meet the demands of the market and keep the business sustainable as well because we could not access the artisans community and it wasn't easy for us to do that. So we're we're kind of diversifying and... Exploring. But the lovely thing, you know, what, what do they say? Needs must. And suddenly you come up with something wonderful mm -hmm. that's another product line, so to speak. So well done. It is. It's very exciting. Mariam, talk to us, you know, a little bit more about the, you know, the Saudi street style book um, under the Abaya. And I know it's an earlier project, but also perhaps tie that into the work that you are doing with empowering youth and making sure that they are looking at creativity as a step for their career. Well, I think, you know, one of the things that's important to know is that it's about leading by example. I mean, there was a study, I, I believe Babson College cited it, where women are more likely to pursue things when they see another woman in that position. So when we see women, you know, being editors or, you know, ca canon ambassadors or working with artisans, this inspires us to take that, that you know, that plunge in and actually do it. And so I think by having under the buy, it was always, it was something that fed off this other initiative in 2016, where I actually went to the United States, um, again, a government initiative, they sent me out there to talk about being a female entrepreneur. And instead, what I did was talk about the, you know, fashion industry as an, as an entrepreneurial, like avenue, you know, for these women, it's one of these old professions where they can interact with women, it's not taboo, you know, they can have a female uh, tailor, supplier, and then female customer and kind of showing that progression. And what I noticed during that talk was that I was still getting filled with the same questions, like, you know, do you have to cover? How come you're not covering right now? Do you have a camel? Like, you know, those really kind of old school, um, quite, you know, ignorant questions. And I said, this is 2016. Why are we still having this dialogue? And I decided to do something about it. And so in 2018, I created uh, Under the By the, the Street Style book. And it was basically me asking people, um, you know, over, over Instagram, hey, submit some the photos of yourself. And we had over a thousand submissions within a week. Um, and within a year, we sold enough to put five girls in university for photography. And two of those girls have actually submitted in the second edition, which now has over 350 women. Um, and it's all you know, quite di diverse in terms of sectors. You have engineers, uh, dermatologists, yoga instructors, restaurateurs. And I really just wanted to show people, this is the face of Saudi. She's different. She's unique. She, you know, and she's also super universal, as we mentioned earlier, you know, the, like to see those, those needs and, and desires. Those are something that every woman can feel. And I just wanted to humanize the Saudi female because I felt for so long, we've just been seeing her in this all black walking five feet, you know, behind her man and, you know, small little clips that you see on CNN or Fox News. And it wasn't us telling it. I mean, even in terms of, let's say, newspapers, I mean, I know Tiffany, working with the New York Times, I've known you for years, you would see Tiffany's amazing photography. And then the, you know, the, the journalist is a non-Arab or, you know, someone that's come quite, you know, maybe they've been stationed in Saudi, which I know, but I'm just meaning it's not from us. And I just, you know, you're like, no. Uh, but you, my point is like, let's have more writers. Let's have more people telling their own story. And so that's kind of how it evolves. And, you know, and I tried to put that in my life too, you know, I was the, the only air professional invited to the White House by then um, uh, First Lady Michelle Obama. I'm on the business of fashion list. I was uh, the only side contributing editor for Harper's Bazaar Arabia. Now um, the fashion um, contributing editor for uh, Harper's Saudi. And I think by being in these positions, you're showing the next generation that it's possible. It's possible as long, you know, even if that that role doesn't exist, make that role exist. Carve that out for you. Carve your niche, <laughs> basically. Indeed, yes. Um, uh, Tasneem, you know, sometimes I think when, you know, and please take this in the, with the right sentiment, um, when I think of wedding photographers, and when many people think of wedding photographers, they probably don't think it's the most exciting job in the world, you know, but again, I don't, and I don't think too many wedding photographers approach their profession like you do. Yes, they have a, a story to tell, but I think you tell it from the heart rather than from the lens, so to speak. But um, I'm going to tie this into a, a question that's come in here from uh, Richard Ford. And um, also, in terms of your job and in terms of accessibility, what obstacles have you encountered that maybe have been a surprise, you know, that you weren't expecting? And I think as women, we, we still find those. We still find them many, many times and in many countries around the world. But if you can remember any that um, may be good and bad, but what were the ones that you thought, whoa, why should that be an obstacle? And then what did you do about it? Um, first of all, I had no idea that most of the weddings that were Saudi couples, they met through Twitter. 
So I didn't know Twitter was a big thing here in Saudi of like of 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 uh, finding a spouse, of falling in love, and that was the best thing that I knew. Well, I'm terrible at Twitter. Throw out and sort of you know throw out some myths immediately on that one because I think people look at this particularly on finding a spouse is you know that everybody else has arranged it that your mothers and grandmothers have done all the business. Yeah. And, and yeah, so the, I mean, the stereotype is that it's an arranged marriage as in it's forced and you're a tribe or your family. And that's not actually true. A lot of times from my parents' generation, the families will kind of find someone suited for you to in, be introduced. But there is usually like in the, it's generally not, there's no one forced to meet anyone or marry anyone. It's just the introduction is like, you know, you're, you're basically setting up your friends, your best friends to meet up. And that's usually the, the general rule in, in the, I guess the peninsula itself, not just even Saudi. And then because of youth, because we have a lot of programs that now they're meeting um, through work or uh, studying uh, medicine or um, Aramco, like there's so many different options now for couples to be introduced to each other, other than just, you know, congregating through social events. So that's something that I've, I've really, you know, been pleasantly surprised and I'm very happy to learn. A lot of the, I think, older generation, there's a lot of um, stories of how women are so defiant to find the best opportunities for their children to go to school and, and be educated, especially in regions that are a bit further away from the main city. So in Ha'il, which is in the north of uh, Saudi Arabia, I met Um Ahmed, who basically... Um, to her husband at the time when she was married, when she was like 17, I think, or 16. And um, the best way for her to have her children educated was to find her husband a second wife, to keep him busy with that and then ask for divorce and then put her children all in schools. And now they're all in their you know 40s and she's very happy with that decision. And I, I've met so many amazing, like I said, women that are just shocking to me to learn about the stories of and the the. The, I don't know, the strength and, and distance that they'll go anything to to kind of further and widen their horizon of what they can have, their opportunities. There's women in, in Riyadh who, um, like um, uh, Aya, basically um, are artisans and they also sell a lot of beautiful things that they are selling now to a Saudi market and abroad. So I'm very, very happy to, to have lots more stories that I, I'm currently publishing on my social media and, um, and uh, different exhibitions across the world. Well, we'll certainly engage more in that, but I love that story, um, you know, of the woman who it's, it almost sounds like it was a win-win situation there. And again, she took the initiative and, you know, made it work for everybody, you know, so while he didn't want to, to divorce her, her, her solution was to... Um, <laughs> Say, let me move out of the way and uh, here I've got to, somebody else that can distract you and take care of you and I'll take care of the children. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's, 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 it's a lovely story in many ways and it has, it has a happy ending. Uh, a great, and for everybody really there, I think so. How interesting. Aya, yeah, you must have also met, you know, women from different cultures and probably women in marginalized communities as well. You know, again, traditions, family norms and all that. How difficult, you know, was it to get people involved in projects and for them, you know, to have the faith and the trust in you? Yeah, it's actually, um, it, it wasn't, it was, like I said before, it was an exploration. It was, it was something I was delving into and I kind of saw how corrupt, their, their corrupt how their societies can be in terms of, of how like male dominant these worlds are and how they didn't really have access to much. Their designs were very limited. They were very skilled. The workforce was so skilled and they wanted to do, they were motivated, but they just wanted that push, that push to like keep them going, to, to help sustain them and like give them basically business opportunities that are customized to them, to their lifestyle and allow them to free up their minds, their souls through creativity. So it was it was a challenge for me to break into this because, because it was I was doing it on my own and I was not backed up by an NGO at the beginning. So it was very difficult, especially that the designs also, like I mentioned previously, were not very traditional, were not very, they were very colorful, very um, modern. So this was a struggle for me to kind of introduce this kind of concept to the woman in these artisan communities. But they were 
responded very well. And I'm, I'm very happy to see this kind of motivation. It's actually moving to see these women wanting to create new pieces. And it's also, it's, it's very funny that I find it very sweet and that like they start naming these um, designs I give them, you know, it's for example, I tell them that this is a design you have to do, they, they name them stuff in Arabic. So for example, I, I gave them this design once of uh, a balloon dog, like I love Jeff Koons, I'm so inspired by his art. So I gave them this, the, the, their design and they were like, oh, we did this and they called that uh, balloon dog uh, Kelp Ferenci, which is a French dog. So it's like they start coming up with names for the for the designs, and it's so moving to see that they're opening up, they're getting exposed to new designs. You know, they're not just being limited. And I can't do this, I can't do that. We're used to this. I came across women that would come to me and be like, "No, we're not used to doing this. This kind of beadwork, we don't do it." So it's, it's fine. It's completely okay. But it's the process, the whole process of creativity is opening yourself up and being exposed to new cultures, to new design mediums. So it was very moving to see that kind of thing from their side, to be honest. And I guess once you get them started and once they, they you know, do, you know, try it once, they're going to, you know, want to do it and they can see that it can work. Miriam, do you want to comment on that? And then I want to ask you a follow-up. Yeah. Speaking of that, I remember one of the women that got um, the scholarship from us was a 42-year-old woman that came into there. And I remember she was obviously the oldest standing out amongst these, you know, 20-year-old girls that, you know, wanted to pursue their education. And she told me, she goes, my son is in the car waiting for me. I just wanted to come and see. And she's like, because I want to show him that it's never too late to chase your dreams. And mm -hmm. that was the one line I was like, she's getting the scholarship. I was almost in tears <laughs> when I heard that, because for me, that was beautiful that you're never too late to go and achieve your dreams. And I mean, she's yeah, one of our scholarship uh, recipients. And there's another just one thing I want to share that because like we were starting to build a community out of the artisans and some of them like didn't draw, didn't have experience in drawing, for example, didn't have experience in, in finishing up the product. So I was so inspired to see how they would find a group of community of women that would want to work with them. So she's like, my. she would call me and be like, my neighbor knows how to draw. Do you mind if she works with me? I was like, of course. Like it's it's a collaborative not a collaborative thing. You can join, you can join, you can add in colors, and just learn. it's a learning process, and it's it's so nice to see how engaging they are. And that's wonderful too, because you're then empowering them to almost build up their little team that you know they can deliver the work to you, but they've you know in, enlightened and um, you know empowered some other women around it. So this is. I mean, this is what it's all about. It is that great domino effect. So keep up the good work on that one. Um, Mary, let me come back to you in terms of, you know, the work you're doing with, with Harper's, with Esquire and all of that. And we're beginning to see, you know, particularly in some of these magazines in the region, we're beginning to see Saudi models. We're beginning to see real Saudi people show up, which is wonderful. It's not just, here's a, an interesting design. You know, so again, how important is it? And I believe you're working, you know, with yeah. a group of people to also make sure that they get they get the market rate as well in terms of what they're worth. Talk to us a bit about that as well. So I've always had this community just, you know, because of my profession with models, creative directors, art directors. I mean, essentially these storytellers from different disciplines. And what we saw was that, you know, with this whole uh, fair representation movement, as I decided to kind of say, okay, well, what about us as well? Let's formalize this community. And so what I did is I started the Saudi Style Council, which basically is for all the creatives around the fashion industry, except for designers. I mean, we're not excluding them, but that's not the main focus. And the idea is that we want to give them a reference point. This is a very green industry. I mean, I'm sure, you know, Sassim, you probably hear this a lot, you know, how much do you charge per hour? And you're like, well, that's not kind of how I work. Or you have a, a you know, a person that just bought a camera that's kind of trying to charge the same rates as, as someone that has 10 years experience. And I mean, it's not their fault. It's because they don't have a reference point. And so what we're trying to do is provide with, um, them with the resources, such as freelance contracts, such as um, you know, standards and regulations, not something that, you know, suggestions, it's not so much a union because it's not formalized in that way, but it's something that I just feel that as the Saudi creatives that already exist, we can kind of come together, leverage our community and make sure that we're benefiting the next generation so they can learn from the experiences that we've had. 
you know, I've had 15 years in this industry having to kind of sell my story to people and, you know, do those kind of token gestures. I don't want that for the next generation. I want them to be valued. I want their stories to be heard. And I feel like, you know, there's no, why, you know, empower or not why empower, but why break these fast ceilings if you're not going to come back and help that next generation go through as well. And so I think, you know, with Saudi Style Council, it's a not-for-profit trade association. Um, we've done covers for, I mean, you name it, Ahia Magazine, uh, September issue. We've done shoots at Neom. We've worked with Harper's, Esquire, um, you know, quite a lot of, of international names, but also a lot of regional ones, because I think it's also important that we are, you know, having them own their own creativity and their own content. I mean, that's just fascinating. And I believe also the Ministry of Culture is, you know, keeping an eye on what you're doing and hopefully might give it a stamp of approval. Definitely. I mean, we're, we're hoping that in a few, you know, few months that we will get endorsed because we do believe that, you know, the ministry is there to, for regulation. They're there to kind of set the, the tone, but it's up to the private sector. It's up to people like Aya that are coming together to kind of push that. I mean, if you look at the U.S., I mean, the CFDA, which is the Council uh, for Fashion Designers of America, that's not a government entity. That's a private thing that has, you know, help through the mayor of, of New York. And, and, you know, they have their different initiatives that help, you know, Fashion Street, uh, Fashion Night Out, those kinds of things. And so, I mean, there's ways to collaborate, but I do think it's up to the private sector to take those, you know, um, those tools from the Ministry of Culture and go with it. I mean, the creative sector to me is something that we definitely want help and support from our government, but I do think that it's something that will thrive as long as it's private. That's just my humble opinion. <laughs> oh, and it's, a, it's a very valid one. And Tasneem, I see you absolutely agree there with her. On that. Uh, you know, uh, obviously making sure that everybody, you know, is, is, is brought to, you know, international attention in terms of the work they do. But Tasneem, something I, I'm wondering about what you're doing, and I think a lot of Saudi stories have been, well, they maybe have not been told, not that they're lost, but they just, you know, were never told because they, they just, it wasn't what one would do. You know, the stories around the, the tribes and the villages would be handed down word of mouth and stuff, you know, not unlike many older traditional societies. But you're managing now to capture, I suppose, moments in time. Is this something that, you know, you're going to continue to do and perhaps maybe expand this now that people are perhaps a little bit more open? And are you finding, you know, any resistance from or, or more welcoming, as you I think you mentioned, from perhaps older people to tell this story because you know it would be a shame for it to be lost because things are moving so fast now all arabs agree that we are raised and brought up with the love and passion of storytelling it's in our blood we love narrating stories that are hundreds and thousands of years ago um so i don't think it's the issue of sharing our story i think it's we've been We've, we did have the lack of education in, in arts um, for the longest time. And then we also have a fear of criticism, of being seen too vulnerable. And I think that's not something just in the region, but it's across the world. And we're, we're still afraid of sharing our most vulnerable moments. And I think with not just the newer, gen the, you know, the, yeah, the newer generation, my daughter's generation, but also um, with my grandparents, they have this fear that their stories will be gone. So with photography, with painting, with storytelling, as in writing, in all forms, with multimedia arts, this is all coming back and it's it's slowly being documented because we realize we've kind of woken up and we're like, wait, we have to document as much as possible before that generation is gone. And those stories are gone. And I think you asked me earlier about wedding photography. For me, it wasn't just the pursuit of finding stories about love, to be honest, and and just only escaping my, my own, um, um, I guess, association with marriage and divorce. It was more of, I think a wedding day is the best form of a workshop that a photographer can have. You're a fashion photographer, you're a portrait photographer, you're a journalist, you know, you're documenting everything as it goes last minute. And there is no do over. Um, and I think also you have to be a businesswoman, you know, I have to you know, negotiate the, the quotes and how much I think I should charge um, editing. So I, I think I really did learn a lot from being a wedding photographer. And a lot of times my own Nat Geo colleagues are like, why are you posting these on your professional account? It's something that we usually shy away from, you know, you just do this for the money. And I'm like, but I'm totally in love with this. I'm I'm very much inspired by the couples that I get to meet. And I always like each couple, I believe has a story. They all have to tell me how they met and whatever story that is, it's all, I have to, I don't think it's, it's forcing, but I just, 
I think if you are in love with the person that you're photographing, the lens is totally different than someone that you don't really care about. And I think with photography itself, it's not just holding the camera. For me, it's a toy. The camera is... I'm, the Canon ambassador, the camera is a toy. And I think um, when you're when you're the camera holder, the bearer, you are in control of that narrative. And what I love to do is to say, yes, I'm holding the camera, but it's your narrative. You are the storyteller. I will only write it and you have full control over what image I publish, what I say. And I think that's really important to kind of flip that and say that we're not really in control of the narrative just because we have the, you know, the camera in our hands. And again, just what you said, how, you know, the Arab tradition goes back to great, you know, centuries of great storytelling and great tales and all of that. And I think we, uh, I, I come from Ireland and, and we share that definitely. But there's a, there's a wonderful friend of mine I must put you in touch with. His name is, and he has an unusual name. His name is Turtle Bunbury. You know, you can't forget this. But he's done this incredible series about vanishing Ireland. And it almost mm -hmm. sounds like when you were talking about getting, you know, some of the, getting some of the uh, older stories on record because, you know, they are vanishing and their likes will never be seen again because things are changing so rapidly. So it's, yeah. um, there's so much going on. Um, uh, Marion, talk to me about, you know, putting, putting Saudi Arabia on the map, so to speak, on the cultural map. You know, we, we sort of look at, you know, a scene in New York, in Paris, in Dubai, in London, you know. Now, what are we going to see in Riyadh, in Jeddah? You know, okay, well, there is, yeah, there is a government mandate where they want to put Riyadh as one of the top 10 cities of the world. But I think what's interesting is that, you know, when COVID hit and we all were forced to lock down, I mean, Justine, you mentioned it, you've gone now to what, 11 regions of Saudi. I mean, we were kind of forced to rediscover our country. And I think that kind of worked to our advantage because now as I would say, quote unquote, ambassadors of our country, because I think anyone with a social media platform, you automatically become an ambassador to your country, right? Especially a country like Saudi, where not a, lies, a lot of eyes have looked inside. So this becomes a platform for everyone. And, and what I think it's, it's happening is that we're really kind of discovering these hidden gems. I mean, Neon, for example, Omloj, uh, Amala. Amala is now going to be one of the world's you know, biggest wellness and beauty centers with Equestrian. They have the world's top five uh, wellness resorts coming in. Um, but I think it's really important that it's not just about kind of importing these international level resorts, but also exporting our culture. We're inviting people to come in and to meet this. I mean, again, with all of the, uh, this whole panel, what we're seeing is that constantly there's these beautiful gems, these beautiful stories that need to be told. And I think by opening up, we're allowing people to come in and meet these people and, and hear their stories. And so I, I definitely see Saudi becoming, you know, this, this mega tourism uh, capital, well, not capital, but a country itself. Um, just because of the fact that it's, you know, it's something that has been hidden, you know, people haven't known about us, people aren't interested. I mean, Tassim, I'm sure even when you're talking about, you know, you're posting, I'm sure those posts that have that private world showcasing are probably the ones that get the most interaction, right? Because people yeah. want to know about it. It's, it's kind of like our infatuation with following these people on their Snapchat. You know, we want to watch them brush their teeth. We want to know what, you know, what toothpaste they're using because like, we're just, you know, that's our human nature. And I think, you know, with Saudi opening up, it's kind of like these things all just aligned, you know, with the lockdown, with with uh, with our government initiative 2030. And it's just aligned in a really beautiful way that I think is really, you know, put Saudi in a, an opportune uh, position. But Mariam, one other thing to come out of this too, when we see this, you know, entire new industry opening up is, you know, really good, um, solid professions and careers coming yeah. out of this. And, um, you know, again, when we come to visit, it will be hopefully Saudis that will be there to to welcome us, you know, and not not exactly. expat. Exactly. And, you know, you are seeing that you are seeing, you know, we have the, you know, Arab hospitality. What's more famous than that? And we're seeing that when you go into these different locations and it's, it's really inspiring to see these these young Saudis doing that. I mean, for example, Talida Tamar is this um, model that now is on the cover of the first issue of uh, Saudi, um, Saudi Harper's Arabia Saudi. And she, you know, took it as a profession. She doesn't get negative feedback. It's amazing to see people accepting her. She's open short uh, a show, sorry, at Paris Fashion Week. She's walked at Milan Fashion Week. I mean, this was some type of industry that we would never even comprehend. And even now when I do talks and I mention her, I'm not even joking. I get girls when I get off stage saying, hey, I want to be a model. And they're full on, you know, covered um, hijaba. And I love that, that they're not allowing that to stop them from doing what they want to do. Again, going back to this thing about being conservative or traditional and being contemporary, those things are not mutually exclusive. And we're seeing that every day with this new generation. 
Yes, it is. It's so exciting. Aya, you know, talk to me again too about empowering the women that are working, you know, with you, empowering them financially. Do you have any stories in terms of, you know, talking to us about how this has helped, you know, different families, how this has helped different women, how has it given them that financial independence and, you know, maybe what have they done with this? Definitely. Before starting with a project with them, I like to know where they come from. I like to know what their goals are and what their dreams are. We all, we're all human beings at the end of the day and we're, we're creatures of, of habits. We have to know that there, there needs to be an end point and why we're doing things. So at the beginning, I like to know what, why they're doing these kind of stuff. And some would tell me that they want to, for example, um, renovate their homes, uh, contribute to the family expenses. It can be like very little stuff, but one thing, one of the stories that really, really empowered me and shaked me, and it really like was something that uh, was very close to me. Um, one time, this lady actually in Ramadan, uh, 2019, uh, she calls me and she tells me how she was able to save up enough money to uh, to travel to Mecca to practice Umrah. And that was like the highlight for me. I knew that I was going to continue doing it. And she's she's a woman that's never traveled. She's and it's been an absolute dream for her to to practice samra. So this was one of the stories. And another story was, for example, a woman that helped her daughter. Um, she was getting married, and they really needed the financial aid. They needed to be financially ready for their daughter to get married and. So she helped that with it. And it was very, so touching to hear all these stories, really. Oh, absolutely. And these are the type of stories, as you say, you know, that make you want to do more and really want to, you know, expand this. And uh, in fact, that's one thing I was just thinking about. Do you have perhaps plans for expansion of this maybe in other areas or are you just focusing on this at the moment? And Definitely. About it? Definitely. So basically the art group is the enterprise and under it is the brand. It's which what we're doing. We're exploring with raw materials. We're exploring with different kinds of materials, craftsmanship versus artisan world and bringing that creativity kind of. But there's also the art group community where we will be bringing artisans from all around and where this can be like a platform for them to express themselves and share their thoughts, learn about other artisanal talents. They can't be tied down to just one kind of artisanal technique they need to be opened up they need to be exposed so maybe and I'm, I'm 100 from also from hearing Maryam stories and this name stories I, I'm I know that these women exist in all parts of the world and in all parts of the Arab world so inshallah when it's the right time and when we can bring all of this together and create that platform to empower women and um, delve deeper basically and share their stories share their creations with each other now, I know we had a little technical issue there with Mariam. Is her is her um, audio still running or have we totally lost her? I'm um, here. Oh, you're still I'm here. Good, good. We, we I'm have here. Still, I'm here. Can so you hear me? Yeah, we can Sorry. definitely hear yeah. you. Having is, some tech issues. Don't worry. Hi. <laughs> good enough. We, what we, is we, okay. in sure. And it's just what, carrying on from what I was saying there, you know, expanding and making, you know, affiliations with other women and other creators. I have a question in here. Uh, from Marlene Kinua uh, talking about um, da -da, partnering with other female creators in different parts of the world to tell the story or depict myths and misconceptions. I mean, I think you're certainly partnering with many people already, but is this the type of thing that perhaps Tasneem and Mariam, both of you, Mariam, I'll start with you, make sure we don't get those technical issues I mean, like to do. Definitely. I think, you know, as women, we're more collaborative just in our nature. You know, we, you know, it's funny, you know, women entering the workforce, especially here in Saudi, we're seeing that um, change in terms of like, you know, the how men work versus how women work. And I think we can thrive as we collaborate. And already, I'm, I'm telling you right now, Aya Tasneem, I'm ready for this Arab artist book. Okay. You bring in the Levant, I'll bring in the Khalij, Tasneem, you shoot it, and Canon, you will sponsor it. I think we're got it. All right. <laughs> the next, the next book, it's on. <laughs> and we're on lives and they can't take it away. <laughs> and, and I'll do the launch. I mean, exactly. Here. You write the forward, you can write the forward and do the launch. We're good. We're set. We have this team right it's now. A virtual launch without a doubt. We've got that team in Arab. So there we go already. Um, we've got it in place. If I can add anything, um, 
If it's regards to photography, then the Canon program every year, there's over 300 photographers that are um, given, um, are paid to fly to um, Visa Pour Le Monde, which is the biggest photojournalism um, festival in, in France. It's based in South of France. And they are... Um, their accommodation and their workshop with the top photographers um, for a week. That happens there every year. This year it happened online and I got to mentor um, five photographers, um, three from the Middle East. So it's, it's global. It's free to apply. So I know Canon is really on top of some of, of amazing, wonderful initiatives for photography. Um, I will also be giving free workshops also sponsored by Canon in Saudi Arabia. So that will also be on my social media platforms. And then there's several, like, if you directly, if, if it's about photography and multimedia arts, then, you know, DM me and I will help you send whichever um, grants or, you know, um, I guess, workshops that applies in the region and the, the project that you're working in. Oh, no, that's so exciting. I'm going to have to wrap this up. But before I do, you know, I want those great words of wisdom and inspiration from all of you, because we have lots of people watching out there and indeed great support coming in from around the region saying, well done, and that you're doing a good job here on this. But um, Aya, in terms of, again, you know, turning, you know, this, this passion, this focus, this dedication of what you did into a profession, your encouragement for other women out there and for people who might be looking at something like that, clearly as possible, what would you advise them? To keep going, to keep going, even if you don't find the answer, just keep doing it and people won't be receptive. It's just you and within your, what you believe within yourself, it's the power from within that will let you keep moving forward and keep excelling in life. So it's just you and yourself. And if you have that vision and if you know that you you believe in it, just keep going. Uh, we do like, we, I, as Arab women, we come from a culture where we do, uh, we do have cultural constraints. We do have social values and we do have a lot of like, we're involved in these kinds of things. So, so I, I just, my advice is to just keep going. It's, don't let anything, don't let the external world affect you, basically. <laughs> and indeed, Tazneem, just in your wrap-up comments, I mean, you have encountered so much of this and you've encountered some great stories, you know, from women in the region. Um, again, I suppose that inspired you to continue to do what you do and building, you know, a tremendous successfully international career. You know, it's it's might not be attainable to somebody tomorrow, but it is something that you put the seeds in and you work towards, would you say? Yes. Um, I think the more that you show and share your vulnerabilities and get to be able to document your own backyard, the more people will accept and respect you and take you for you know at your value. They'll be able to trust that since you shared your story, I can also share mine. Now I was really hoping here that we were going to have that last share from Marion, which um, <laughs> you know it's uh, we we still have a minute or two. She might actually come back on this, but um, I know she had some technical issues here, which. You know, this is what happens on platforms like this, and it's just <laughs> unfortunate. But, uh, I mean, look at the connectivity that this has actually given us. And I'm sure this has given great connection to, to the people, to your community, Aya. I mean, you have, probably haven't been able to go see them, but I bet you've been in touch with them all over the last year or so. Do you mean the women artisans? Yes. Actually, because I was telling you that we, we could not access these communities in the last year, and I, I had to focus on the business side of things and try to incorporate both the world of contemporary and incorporating different materials into their world. So I kind of, because it was, it was still like that, I was delving more into the business side, and I started exploring more with, the mater with which materials we can explore with. And we did, of course, we did artisanal work and it was not as strong and it was not as how I wanted it to be. So it kind of, the pandemic kind of hindered that and slowed out the production, but we're hoping, I'm very positive and inshallah when it's the right time and we can get going and we can move inshallah, it, it will get better and better. <laughs> uh, thank you and good luck to you. And Tasneem, I'm thank sure you so you're much. keeping in touch with people and I suppose, this year, I think for everybody, we've all stepped back a little bit. We've all loved it, what we're doing. And it's maybe given us an unexpected breather that now we're ready for the next side. Exactly. It's given us time to reflect a lot and to look inwards instead of outwards, instead of always trying to look at what's the next you know, possibility for a story to tell what is, what can I contribute? What can I add value to my own life? And those really important around me. So yeah, yeah it's been an inspiration. That's actually one of the bright spots of the pandemic, like just 
releasing it, releasing everything and living in the now and just and knowing we're all fun. together. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it. That's it. So, this, this, yes, I, I don't think we've seen anything like it, you know, around the world whereby everybody has been impacted and we all need to actually, you know, it is the old cliche, build back better, but yes, indeed, that's exactly what we have to do. And another thing I want to add, last thing I want to add, that the pandemic, I've, I really like, it, it was, it's tough times for everyone. So for me, I, I thought about it in that kind of sense. It's either that we keep saying, oh yeah, we're surviving, it's tough times, or we say we're thriving. So we need to choose, it's either surviving or thriving. And because it's something, it's an experience that will live in us forever. It's like embodied in us. It's not like a day or two, it's been a year already now. So it's, it's just that we have to create it. Up to, I guess it'll add up to all the great stories whereby I'm sure they'll all be looking at it years from now going, no way, it never happened. <laughs> They're all saying, we remember back in the day. Listen, I better go or we'll, we'll be but a memory. So listen, thank you so much to both of you, to the three of you. Indeed, thank if Miriam is listening, we'll make sure that uh, we send our regards and our farewell to her. To Aya, thank you so much. And Tess, thank you so thank much. Thank you for thank your you. time. Bye. And indeed, just a moment, and I'll thank our audience on our behalf. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for your encouragement, making sure that uh, you let us know you were there. This was Frontiers of Innovation, a live initiative brought to you by Canon. We're going to continue to bring you really interesting dialogue every month. We have a great lineup of speakers already, and I think we had a tremendous start here in March, the 2021 season really kicking off this with such great enthusiasm, such great ambition, such great courage, and you know, such great optimism as well of all that can be done. If you've missed any of our previous episodes, they are there on the website, Frontiers of Innovation. So be sure to check in and make sure that you keep an eye on that. And again, so thank you all for joining us, from me at the trainer, from all of us at Canon, from our technical team, from everybody putting Frontiers of Innovation together. I wanna to say farewell to you in the meantime, Stay safe and stay engaged with Canon and Frontiers of Innovation. We're going to bring you lots in the months to come. Thanks again.